fire and fly, but they're going to be going to talk about the, the Italian service to uh, South America. His name is Sam Pizzella, and he's been a school teacher for 40 years, recently retired, so I'm sure that they're going to make you know, a very decent budget to survive the college level. He's collected uh, airmail for about 45 years, and uh, he's written several papers and given a couple of talks on the subject.
but quite successful in doing that. And the history of Balbo, especially his relationship with Mussolini, is very interesting. And the politics uh, that we've talked about so far between the various nations also had problems internally, uh, especially with Mussolini trying, of course, to keep the goodwill of uh, people and uh, these greater than life aviation figures, it's sort of like a Lindbergh, Balbo was the Lindbergh of Italy. Uh, he became something of a rival to uh, Mussolini's popularity. Uh, but you see, his formation of flight follows basically the same path, uh, using float planes from Rome along the coast of Africa down to Greece. The first land-based attempt to try to motor plane uh, in 1934, uh, ended up crashing in Brazil. And of course, who are they going to blame? They're going to blame the French. <laughs> because the French were supposed to provide the uh, kind of navigational guide since they were arriving late at night. Maybe the French had taken off a sort of late night reception, uh, and no one was in really to provide these Italians with the landing information. But at any rate, uh, that was a, an attempt in 1934, uh, also quite useful. And you'll see a plea of cooperation because the covers that were carried were then continued down to Rio by an American for the courtesy. The flight that really sparked Italian imagination in trying to get this Atlantic service going was a flight of a group known as the Green Mice, the Sorci Verdi. Uh, and they flew in January of 1938 while uh, Guati or Alla Latoria, as it's still known at the time, was deciding the approach that they were going to take. Uh, these are some surviving covers from that. Uh, I don't own them, they were auctioned off, uh, as you see, uh, in 2007. Uh, but these green mites were, in particular, sparking imagination because one of the leaders of them was Mussolini's son. Just a few months later, in March, as you see, still using the old name, we have the first experimental flight. And these are sent back to the main office in Rome. Uh, and sometimes you see in the general literature that they were all addressed this way. That's not so, as you can see from this example, which is sent to the director of Air France in Paris. Sort of an echo coming. Uh, again, part of that national rivalry. And I suspect that actions like this are partly what made it impossible for the French and the Italians to come to some agreement. They recognized that there was a challenge uh, to their service, possibly the uh, Italians promoting the reliability of their aircraft, which certainly Babel's flight has done, uh, Canada's flight had done to, to the Orient, uh, caused some problems. So here you see a fuselage of the uh, Mati line, an aircraft from it. And you'll notice that the three green mice are there on the fuselage along with the fasces and the symbol of Mati, which is the flying dove used on a number of the first parts. So this flight uh, really did uh, sort of spark the notion in the Italians that they could be successful uh, in this enterprise. But when the French did not allow overflight in their territory, they cooperated with the Spanish and Portuguese in, in creating landing places in solid in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and we've already heard about the unreliability of various uh, landing places uh, in Rio. So they arrive in uh, Recife, but they take off from the town. And two of the directors are pilots from that Green Mice flight, uh, Bruno Mussolini being one of them. Uh, what is a lot less known is that the uh, director in Brazil was Carlo 
Ponzi, our famous Ponzi scheme. <coughs> and here we see him after his locking service at the he, whatever he did, he got into trouble. <laughs> he got into trouble in Canada, got into trouble in the US with sponsoring illegal immigrants. Uh, you may know about Birmingham, where I'm from, that we've had a little problem with people going to jail for manipulating the sewer system. Uh, he started it. When he got out of jail in Atlanta, he came over to the county adjacent to Birmingham, and at that time, uh, the government was sponsoring the development of a uh, sewer system, trying to promote public health. And he wrote a letter to someone he had met in person in Atlanta, outlining the fact that he could make money. So he started two sewer systems in the county adjacent to where I live. He also got it covered because when all this started to fall apart in Brazil, he had written his memoir, was unable to pay his bills to the publisher in New York. You see him here on the beach in Rio reading his memoir. That caused him a little bit of trouble. I'm still trying to track down uh, the source of this, I think it is, in fact, in the National Archives uh, at the uh, uh, Some of it's still available through um, the photography service, but they do not have this one listed. Uh, I need to talk to the blogger and find out. But you'll notice what it says up here. That, it's not very clear, that he got in a little bit of trouble because he revealed to the Brazilians the fact that they were manipulating currency. Well, he was good at manipulating currency. That's what got him in trouble in five key months. So that Lottie was fined $85,000 for that illegal activity. And in fact, in the end, when I talked about the end of the service, uh, when it began to collapse, yeah, the Brazilians were bringing the various local people in. Uh, he was held in jail in Cabrito and possibly questioned uh, very harshly and gave up a lot of the uh, activity that had, of course, concerned the British with the overflight of the Italian plane across the Atlantic and uh, increasingly the American. Here we have two route maps. Uh, the standard route, uh, and this is a copy from Beats, the South Atlantic Service. On uh, the left-hand side, an area that had intrigued and then really got me into collecting, a uh, copy from an article in 1994 where the Lati service at various times became very critical in transmitting European mail onward up to North America. This was especially true when the British began intercepting mail in Bermuda uh, and even the U.S. objected. Bad. So we had the winter that southern route on the M18. Uh, and as the British uh, noticed that the Italians were transporting the mail by this alternate route, they moved their sensors down to Trinidad and they moved them also to Jamaica. And I'll show you a couple of them bit that is described in a very rational way, uh, as though the sensors are still in view. And here is the route, leaving, uh, you know the airport east of Rome, though I have to take a look at the building, it's a few miles away. Leaving on a Thursday morning and arriving in uh, Recife, Pernambuco uh, on Sunday, ultimately in Rio on uh, Sunday afternoon. And the return route, departing on Thursday morning and arriving back in Rome at Pernambuco on Monday afternoon. Here is an example of the first flight cover on uh, the route southward, westward. And these are the stamps that you typically find. The first uh, is a, a trial stamp for the first flight. The middle one is the one that typically occurs with Via Lati step down. And the third one, less usual, and typically found on uh, mail originated in the Vatican. Although you see in this example that they're using the more common one, this is the first flight cover that uh, in the next year. On the return.
return flight from the south, and only on that return flight, initial flight from north and south, they departed the same route. And in this case, on the northward flight, they ran into a storm in Morocco and had the first flight northward. It was lost. The second flight was lost, as you see, in January 1941. No one Extension of the service to Buenos Aires uh, in June 41. Rather than relying upon some of those German services that are still offered and American services that support uh, And in general, even though it was an Italian lot, the predominance of mail carrying was from Germany. Basically, Lochte took up the slack for the German um, correspondence, business correspondence, and the like uh, caused by the end of um, Lufthansa service in uh, August of 39. You'll find in the change of aircraft, once the French service was ended, that they had to put larger, heavier aircraft in to take care of again the increase in cargo demand. But uh, there were significant Italian links in South America. There was a very large uh, immigrant population in Argentina, Chile, and Peru, just as there was a large German immigrant population business connection in those same countries. And especially in Peru, you have a second factor that would come in, a very large immigrant population of Japanese. Today, there is what is called a fusion culture between uh, Peruvian and Japanese culture, reflected in the food. Here are just some examples of various types of Italian mail first, uh, like things that, for example, like this one, uh, the, the consul of the diplomatic. Uh, or connecting various religious groups which have some interest uh, for a variety of reasons. And large commercial mail, notice in this case, to a, uh, a German. Uh, and it is inscribed up above, and you see, by a condor block. Again, trying, obviously because it is of German origin, Keeping that sense of national pride, even if we're not Lufthansa flying, when it gets to South America, we're going to handle it for you. Okay. Uh, the confusion that collectors will often find is that you'll still see things like Lisbon uh, on mail. It doesn't go by Lisbon. One of their choices was to allow it to go by North America. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, are unclear of the services that are going to be available. And I'm going to show some examples here of that kind of confusion in the sender's mind. I also have a personal interest in the impact that war has, not just on things like civil aviation, but on human beings and their will to survive under very difficult circumstances in World War II. Uh, a lot of that has to do, of course, with uh, Jews who are trying to survive. Uh, and some of those agencies that are trying to help immigrants and to protect immigrants. And this is one such example uh, to a uh, group, HICAM, uh, which is a committee for the protection of uh, Israeli immigrants in Chile. Here is a similar cover. Notice that Hicken has now changed its address. They have a different box number. Probably changed the physical address as well. This is after the end of the service. Now it has to be directed northward. And this is one that uh, ends up uh, going to a similar agency in Marseille, uh, but it was returned to Sydney. Where it was returned, not clear. Probably uh, the U.S. knew that they couldn't make connections. One of the things in collecting World War II airmail is 
you know, things that a postal historian has to take into account that typically they don't. And that is the way that the sensor marking indicate a routing that the cover may not. I used to communicate with Von Beveren and we would often exchange covers. Uh, and the only explanation for the kind of incongruencies and uh, irrationalities of the cover was forget the postal historian aspect of rate route, where was the center, where was it held, how did it go on from there. And so in this particular case, that's something you need to take into account. The other is what's happening in the war. Uh, and what complications that might have. And so in this particular instance, uh, sometimes mail uh, to uh, southern France uh, was being held uh, in the way that, for example, outward and inward mail to Switzerland was handled in different ways. Everyone has an interest, especially as things unfold, uh, when you're not belligerent, when you're neutral, all those things need to be taken into account. The German piece, which looks like it ought to be philatelic, uh, but it really isn't. It's one from provincial to another one from Germany to South America. Uh, I include it because it has, of course, stamps that look like they ought to be philatelic, but if you were an agency that could use such postage, you did not have to pay for something like fee. So oftentimes they're used for propaganda purposes. As I say, uh, again, a lot of mail is between religious groups, either Germany or Italy to the corresponding area. Here's one that goes to Colombia. Uh, Colombia and Venezuela were more willing to succumb to pressure by, from the Americans than other South American countries, something I'll mention again in the end of the One aspect of what happens to human beings in war is identified here, uh, the famous story of the Graf Zeppelin, which had caused such problems for British <coughs> ocean uh, traffic broke in, in the around the area of Africa, but then also in the South Atlantic uh, corner uh, and the Rio Plata Valley uh, was damaged, put in at Montevideo for repairs, and it put some pressure on it, so we were going to say we got to leave in 72 hours. The captain leaves, but he thinks that now the British have become reinforced, afraid that the whole ship would go down. He decides to save his men to sink the ship, and they become a miracle in turn. In uh, South America, correspondence directed to them typically, initially, is directed to the consulate. The men were eventually moved around, first at Martin Garcia, uh, but then in 13 other locations, uh, so one in particular, Cordova, so we had a cover. Uh, to the consulate there in Cordova, uh, we addressed, and then we had one somehow back the road home, back to, um, this way, and so that's what we covered back from Mark LC. So in turn, email, both in North America and South America, uh, is of special interest. When the Italians became more aware of the conversation of the holding of mail in Cuba, they published a directive that now they would send mail by the national route. So if it was going to South and Central America, no longer use the system. We had to send it by the national route, very useful radiology, national route should something be possible. And so in this month's version of the Northwest Journal. This cover has been published. Uh, it is a cover uh, by the Marchese uh, Marini uh, to New York to Eli Whitney. 
at the price that eventually becomes city banks. Yes. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, it was held uh, probably because it had some uh, financial material that the British thought would have been an advantage to the adversary. It really was not a working stock. The Greenies, interesting, uh, their fortune is 600 million euro. It is currently kind of kind of dramatic events. So it's a story of all this time. Finally released after the war, and the article talks about the you know, that loss from the Shellac. The British also confiscated mail from neutrals, which is quite unusual. So here we have a Portuguese uh, mailing to a German firm in New York, held up uh, by the British released after the war. Here's an example where in the upper cover, Hans is receiving mail in Union City, New Jersey. Uh, and he's receiving it by Lockheed and the South American Rock. They're trying to avoid the confiscation. He was probably a sailor on one of the standard oil tankers where the Germans were deterred and sent off to this part of the coast. Once he's deterred, why pay the extra money? So once he's in Bismarck, in the internment camp, they're going to pay the cheaper rate. So they're paying the extra fee. Similar, you see three covers related to it. This is a French soldier, <coughs> France falls. They take them to the eastern front and put them in the offices. Initially French, other people join them. Uh, you can tell from the handwriting that the Via Air Mail uh, is by the same person who addresses it. So we're going to assume that's the attorney, okay, the person who did it. By air post via South America is in a different hand. So he hands a cover in some of the officers in charge of the mail. They're now going to send it by the South American route probably because they don't want any information revealed. And you notice it's prison of war. In the previous month, on a two-week basis, the same fellow is writing to his relative. And his relatives are not refugees in uh, check with the uh, people in the United States of Library of Richmond. I asked them to look at their telephone records and all sorts of things. That family had been original. If we look here, uh, the Via Air Mail is written in the same pen and hand as the address again, and it's inscribed transatlantic, which is typically what you get uh, letters inscribed by fan uh, 18. And we have the same uh, previous Gaithanu uh, post, the first of the world now, stamped that we saw on the first cover. Two weeks earlier, sending to his relatives, and in the same hand, he's saying, by transmitting. We, we don't have personal war mail on that. We don't have any of the other variations. He doesn't know how it's going to go. The German officers are probably determining it and paying the post. This one is of interest because now we're doing the South American route, not where it can be caught at Trinidad. You see a cover in a second, not hurry. Uh, but it's going to go up the West Coast, and it is caught by British censorship, probably actually. And you'll notice when and the date of the week is caught. December 7th, 1930. The other censorship, examined by 4450, is a U.S. censor. So, when did that occur? Did they set that up in Miami within a 24 hours of the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Not likely. So this cover had to be held somewhere for a period of time, and most likely was held by the British in Jamaica. So unless you have a back stamp that shows, you're not going to know. 
if you only rely upon published rapid departures and arrivals, you don't have a vaccine. The departure time does not tell you anything about the arrival time. The arrival time tells you most likely what the flight was to carry. It doesn't tell you a whole lot about where it was held up along the way. And sometimes you can see things that are held for six weeks, and six weeks in session. You go through two or three things. Well, people are just kind of distilling the information that must have been in there. We'll go quickly through this. Again, variety of types. This one by Lima, Cristobal, Mexico. A variety of folks. Uh, here's one. Again, over South America, Rio, Buenos Aires, Lima, Cristobal, Mexico, and New York. I don't have any confirmation of any of them went by Mexico to ground to the world. Most of them came from the Caribbean. There's one caught in Trinidad. Just two more uh, cover uh, well known. One of two from Mexico by the Great himself. And this one, no one knows about. It's the only one that exists. Uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, any mail from the Soviet Union in World War II was rare. Uh, I sent this one to uh, Professor Ackerman, who was a specialist in Russian airmail. He had never seen one. He had never seen any before. Uh, and it had to be carried by one of the Soviet But there's more here. My time is up. We'll take questions. I do have multiple examples of this, and I have this that I can hand out. Do you have any questions? I'm aware of mail coming to the What's the question? They're carried by some by Pan Am, some by LAP, depend on depending on where they're going to connect. Uh, the most interesting um, aspect of that is the cover that we skipped over. And that's one from Colombia to China on to uh, Germany. So if you could not get it to Germany from South America again because of this interception, one of the ways to get it to the Orient was to go down either to Palau, the port of Lima, or to Santiago and send it over to Shanghai. At Shanghai, if it was going to go on to Germany, it would then go by the Trans-Siberian route, um, and uh, it could either go the whole way by the northern route, or it would go partway and then go down to the Istanbul to be redirected down. So there, one of the covers I'm going to show you was irrational is a cover like that uh, to the United States and it's going to go off to Shanghai and it's being described on the Russica site, Chicago Collectors Club and uh, one other site. Lockheed to South America comes up caught by British censorship and they're going to describe the British censorship as at the Bermuda. They say the problem will rise is by the southern route up to New York, send it to Bermuda to be sent to back to New York, and then on to Chandler. Irrational. And that's because the censorship becomes an important aspect of the route. The British moved the censors down into the uh, Caribbean, one at Jamaica, the first at Trinidad. As people found ways around Trinidad, they found ways to move the censor back. There wasn't a great deal of cooperation between the Americans and the British on that censorship. They would never take the cover that was in New York, destined for Shanghai across the Pacific, and send it to the British and the New York to be censored. So it's a national mistake. Thank you. Anybody else has questions for the same? I'm sure. Uh, stick around. Uh, and there's a couple of